This is a quick and basic review on ethylene glycol and cholecalciferol toxicity, which are common renal toxicants seen in veterinary medicine. So ethylene glycol is from many sources that you'll find around your home. It's present in car antifreeze brake fluids, home solar units, condensers, and heat exchangers. It's usually um, so the pet has gotten into something around the garage, under the sink. Uh, antifreeze in the bottle is 95% ethylene glycol, so it's a very, very high percentage of ethylene glycol. All species are susceptible to toxicity from this, uh, with cats and rabbits being the most sensitive, but dogs are the most commonly exposed, and any exposure is considered serious. So there's three stages of toxicosis, and knowing the three stages is important because it impacts the treatment plan. So stage one is 30 minutes to a couple hours after exposure, and that's when you're gonna see neurological and GI signs, including ataxia, vomiting, lethargy, coma, and hypothermia, and also a marked PUPD in dogs. Stage two is acidosis. This is 12 to 24 hours after exposure. You're gonna see dehydration. You might see a tachycardia, seizures, pulmonary edema, congestion. And the acidosis is caused by metabolites that were made in stage one. And stage two is the stage most likely to kill cats that have been exposed. And stage three is 12 to 72 hours after exposure. And this is when you're gonna see renal failure. Um, and you're going to see an oliguria or anuria and abdominal pain. So the metabolites, they take about 12 hours to form and they are what cause our clinical signs. So glycoaldehyde causes the CNS depression that we see. Glycolic acid has a very long half-life and it's really important because it's the major contributor to our acidosis that we see. Glycoxylic acid has very little clinical signs, and oxalic acid is the last metabolite made, and it combines with calcium in the blood to form calcium oxalate crystals that then deposit into the kidney and also cause a systemic hypocalcemia. So they precipitate into the renal tubules, causing renal scarring and fibrosis, and that's why um, the calcium oxalate is so dangerous because it's causing kidney damage that you'll see with an increased BUN and creatinine, but remember that won't show up on your blood test until stage three. And the metabolites very early on will cause you know, CNS depression, PUPD, and GI irritation presenting as vomiting and diarrhea. So to diagnose, you'll find calcium oxalate crystals in the urine and the kidney calcium levels will be very elevated and on palpation, the kidneys will be firm. So to treat, you have to start aggressive treatment. If exposure was less than 45 minutes, then you can do emesis and lavage. Activated charcoal does not work for this toxicant because the molecules are too small. Um, stabilization, you wanna give the, the animal diazepam for seizures and plenty of IV fluids, but you're gonna to wanna to monitor your ins and outs, and you can give them sodium bicarb for acidosis. In terms of an antidote or you know, an extra supportive treatment is ethanol or fomipazole, which is also known as 4-methylpyrazole or 4-MP. So which one do you give? So ethanol can contribute to more acidosis, from lactic acid formation and CNS depression, and you gotta be careful that you don't then cause an alcohol toxicosis. And then 4-MP does not cause an increased acidosis or CNS depression, which is good, but you don't wanna give it with ethanol at the same time because you'll then actually cause a worse alcohol toxicosis. So ethanol competes with the ethylene glycol for metabolism by alcohol dehydrogenase, and it saturates the binding sites. And this is best given if within six to eight hours post-exposure. It's inexpensive and readily available. It's recommended to use a clear filtered vodka versus 4-MP is a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase. It's more expensive than ethanol and it has to be compounded by a pharmacist. And you continue to give this until there's normal renal function and the acid-base status is normal for 24 hours. Okay, next, toxin. So cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 toxicity is found in rodenticides. Um, there's different types of rodenticides and this is just gonna focus on the ones that um, cause a cholecalciferol toxicosis. So they, you're, it's gonna increase the serum calcium and phosphorus, lead to soft tissue mineralization and renal failure because the kidney will be mineralized. So cholecalciferol in rodent bait is, has a very high bioavailability, rapid absorption, and it's highly lipophilic. 
So the mechanism of action is cholecalciferol goes to the liver and then it's transformed in the calcifidiol, which then goes to the kidney, and that's formed in the calcitriol, which is the active metabolite. This increases the absorption of calcium in the body, stimulates bone resorption of calcium, and increases renal tubular resorption of calcium. So clinical signs, the early signs are within 12 to 36 hours. You're going to see weakness, lethargy, anorexia, polyuria, polydipsia, vomiting, increase in phosphorus and calcium, and an azotemia. Um, the later signs are oliguria and anuria and calcification of the renal tubules. Other vascular tissues and vessels will calcify too, including the kidney, heart, diaphragm, and aorta, and this leads to a permanent calcification. So treatment, if less than four hours post-ingestion, you can um, induce emesis. You can give them activated charcoal. You, can, you have to check the calcium, phosphorus, and BUN and creatinine every day for up to four days post-exposure. Um, diuresis at two times maintenance with 0.9% sodium chloride. Do not give calcium-containing fluids. Uh, you can use a furosemide to help get calcium out and prednisolone, which does the exact opposite of cholecalciferol. It reduces bone reabsorption of calcium, decreases intestinal absorption of calcium, and increases renal excretion of calcium. So the prognosis is good if caught early, and then prognosis starts to decrease if the calcium and phosphorus are elevated for too long of a time. And it really depends on how much of the soft tissue has been calcified because this is poorly reversible and in some cases permanent. And fun fact, puppies have a normally high calcium and phosphorus. So if you have a puppy come in that looks like it might have gotten to rodenticide and you see the calcium's really high, you can be careful and remember that sometimes that's probably a normal high calcium, but you just want to make sure things are consistent with the history and, and you want to really evaluate the patient itself. Okay, thank you so much and good luck with studying.